Thank you for joining us for the afternoon October Gate Equity webinar, where we explore topics related to equity and graduation success. I want to check our sound, so if you can hear us, can you please uh, write something into the chat? And we'll make sure that everybody's sound is good to go, and then we'll start up in just a minute. All right, sound is looking pretty good. I'm glad you all could join us. This webinar will be recorded and it'll be posted in the next couple of weeks. The PowerPoint is posted on OSPI on the Gate Equity webinar page in the archive section. So if you follow along, that's where the slides are. Uh, also, we'd like to ask that you direct um, questions that you want us to answer into the Q&A and not the chat. That way we can make sure that we get to those and answer them responsibly. Uh, I'm Kevin Anderson, OSPI Graduation Equity Program Supervisor, and today's topic is Students Who Smoke or Vape, a Red Flag for Supports. We chose this topic because many of our student assistance professionals overwhelmingly said that information on vaping is a priority. October is also known as October Catch. Uh, PBS Apps tells us that the number of office discipline referrals that students receive by the end of October is a good predictor of the number of referrals that they're likely to receive by the end of the year. And research shows that 50% of students who had six or more total office discipline referrals during the course of the year already had two or more office discipline referrals by the end of October. So that's the number to look for. We want to encourage you to take a look at those referral patterns this month. It's a great way to get a global picture, but also a really useful screening tool for targeted supports. And Deb's going to get more into that as we go. Uh, I'm joined today by OSPI's Mandy Paradise. Um, she is a student assistance program supervisor here at OSPI. And ESD 112's Deb Jandroff, Drandoff, and Vancouver School District's Tina Johnson. Thanks for being here today. We're so glad to have you. At OSPI, our vision is all students prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. Um, the Gate Equity webinar is brought to you through the Office of System and School Improvement. And today we're going to be talking about, um, we want to get you an idea of the scope of this public health issue, to take a closer look at what's happening with Washington students, and get real advice from the field. I'm going to hand it off to Mandy. Why do you think this conversation is so important, Mandy? Thanks, Kathy. Hi everyone. Uh, so I was asked to introduce this work and talk about why we're covering this topic. And in short, it's just because we really, really care about kids. We care about them living happy, healthy lives, and we care about their life course and the adults that they're going to become. We know that tobacco and nicotine are not new concerns. In fact, public health campaigns have done such a good job of helping us understand the risks that it even feels a little bit like old news. Except, as today we're going to cover, it really isn't old news. Vaping and vape devices have brought a new age of concerns with nicotine being only one of the substances that teens have access to. In a state with legalized marijuana, including those that can be vaped, uh, some are increasingly accessible to youth. And it's not enough to be concerned with just the school impact of these behaviors and devices. As we're going to learn with Deb and Tina, there are significant health and social impacts that come with smoking and vaping. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. So smoking and vaping take their toll on the whole student. If we look at smoking and vaping from just a health lens, we know that biology and genetics have a role in predisposition to addiction, but it also has to do with accessibility. We also know that social environments impact teen use, including family, peers, uh, media and culture also have a role, and prevention science teaches us that if youth don't perceive a behavior as harmful, they're more likely to do it, especially if they earn social capital among their peers. Teens are also forming their way in the world. They're actively looking to make meaning of themselves and of others, and they're contending with adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, negative stress, and sometimes mental health issues. For some of our youth, they lack supports that can protect them from risk factors, and they are actively seeking ways to medicate and cope with such experiences. So all this is to say that teen smoking and vaping have a big impact on teens and that smoking and vaping can tell us a lot about our students. So that's the why. It's just because we, we really care. 
Today, we get to hear from ESD 112 staff about a less discussed part of teen smoking and vaping. It is not the usual overview of tobacco. We're really lucky to have Deb Drandoff, the Director of Prevention and Youth Services, and Tina Johnson, one of Deb's staff who is a student assistant specialist. Deb has worked in the field of prevention and intervention for 28 years. 16 of those have been with ESD 112. Both Deb and Tina's experience in the fields of education and behavioral health have informed this presentation, and with them, we can ask ourselves the really big question. After all, if we care about students, how can we best help them? And we're gonna take a moment to ask you a question just to get an idea of our audience. Um, when you think of students vaping, smoking, nicotine, are you more inclined to think of it as an issue related to discipline, health, or addiction? And if you have questions for Mandy or uh, Deb or Tina as we go, you can put those into the questions and we'll make sure that we address those. We're just going to give it one minute just to show where we're at. Do you want to see this? Show. It'll, we'll show it in a second. Mm -hmm. All right. It looks like we've got a pretty good answer there. And we'll share those results so you can see them. So it looks like 67% said that they think of it as a health, health issue. So, um, we're gonna hand it off to Deb so that she can talk to us a little bit more about what this looks like in Washington and why is this? Do you think it's a health issue, Deb? It's all three, I guess. <laughs> it becomes a discipline issue, and uh, but it's both. It's both health and and addictions are are the the main issues. So um, thank you, Mandy. Thank you so much for advocating that this topic be included in the Gates webinar series. And thanks to all of you who are participating in the webinar today and taking time out of your busy schedule. So the data that I'm going to share with you, um, the conclusions and my recommendations all really are developed over a, a 20 year professional learning journey that I have, have been on. Um, this journey, my experiences around this topic have really become a personal passion of mine. And so I'm gonna share with you a, a condensed <laughs> recap of this 20 year journey and the information that I've learned along the way and how I've come to um, look at the data and the conclusions and recommendations that I'm going to make to all of you. And I hope that as going through this journey and looking at some of the data that, that we've learned along the years will also help you in re-looking and reframing how you view your students who are using nicotine products. So, my, so as Mandy said, I've been at the ESD for 16 years. And before that, uh, for over a decade, I did residential care. I ran residential programs for JRA. I worked at Green Hill School and managed group homes in Tacoma. And then I moved to Portland in August of 1998 to, I was hired to run an, an adult a drug alcohol treatment residential center, the Women's Residential Center run by Volunteers of America in Portland. And it's a six month residential treatment center for 40 women dealing um, with addictions. And I was new to the adult system and, and adult treatment and residential treatment. And I'll never forget my first day when the staff member took me on a tour of the facility and, and she took me into the dining room and said, you know, we, we really are, are on top of all the latest research and we don't want our women to uh, trade one addiction for another. So we've removed all the sugar and all the caffeine out of the program. I'm like, oh. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, because it, while you're in the recovery process, you could shift your focus of, of addiction to products such as that. And I, I was a little surprised. And, and at that moment, I looked out the patio doors and they were on break from groups. And what I saw, I think all of you kind of are probably seeing this and know what I'm going to say, but 
every one of the 40 women in treatment were smoking and every single staff were smoking with them. And I, it, I had that moment of kind of cognitive dissidence of like, oh, well, so wait, what about? <laughs> and if we're talking about all these other issues and addressing addiction, what's happening with all the smoking? And I had an immediate reaction from that staff member of, oh, no, you know, well, we can't take away everything at once and, and we have to prioritize what we do. And no, you know, we don't address it. And um, I got a message pretty clearly don't touch that and I didn't have any answers and I didn't understand why and I was really struck um, not knowing and there was no information about about the link between tobacco and addictions and I was really stumped and I was new and I didn't want to cause any waves and so I didn't bring it up again and then about four years later um, I had opportunity to I, I was a little tired of running residential treatment centers and I had an opportunity to go back to working with youth again and um, was hired by ESD 112 in January 2003 to be their youth tobacco grant coordinator. And so I was able to get back into working with youth and into this new topic of how do we address tobacco with youth. And in 2005, I had an opportunity to go to a national tobacco conference in Chicago. And lo and behold, on the agenda was a workshop tobacco and addictions, what you need to know. And it just like, oh my God, I have to go find out. I was so struck by the amount of smoking that I saw when I worked in treatment and I didn't understand it or the consequences. And so I went to that workshop and it changed my, it, 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 it impacted my heart, it impacted my mind, it impacted my work. I was shocked, I was um, upset because I'd been part of a system that wasn't a go and was motivated to try to bring this information back and do something about it. So I came back to the state. I got an ally by uh, um, a name. That some of you may know Paul Davis, who worked at the tobacco program at the time. He also had a background of working in treatment. And together we said, Let's, we've got to bring this information to the state of Washington. So we found funding to bring keynote speakers in, for the addictions conference and for the behavioral health conference. And then in a few years, we found some other grants to actually fund me half time to go around the state and provide training and technical assistance to any addiction and behavioral health center that wanted to learn more about the impact of tobacco on their uh, clients and to, to start providing education and, and cessation supports. And over time, we made a difference. There was policies in place where staff couldn't smoke with their clients anymore. Many of our facilities have gone completely tobacco-free, and I think that it, we've come a long way with the adult addictions and mental health field starting to see that tobacco is a, a problem and maybe is a priority to, um, to address. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of the data I had around that work with the adults, and then, sh and then we'll go into where that took us into our conclusions with the youth that that we work with. So, so here's the data that I got in that workshop that, that really blew my mind. Um, so if we look at adults that have addictions, so any adult that has a substance use treatment diagnosis, 70% of those adults are tobacco users. Wow. And so to give you some perspective right now across the, in the nationally adult uh, smoking rates are at 17 percent in the state of Washington it's 14 to 15 percent so it's really um, a very high percentage of people that have addictions also are smoking a lot of the feedback I, I've received from from folks that work with this population they have said over and over well we can't take away everything at once the, the prevailing logic was we get them into recovery first, then after they're stable in their recovery for a few years, then that's the time to start addressing tobacco. And what the research has shown that not only is that not true, it's the opposite that's true. That uh, folks who go through treatment and do not stop smoking in treatment, continue to smoke, are at twice the rate to relapse um, to using what they were that they went to treatment for whether it's alcohol or, or drugs. So continuing to smoke actually increases the likelihood that they're going to relapse. So again, waiting is not the answer. We want to integrate and we want the more we can help people quit smoking while they are in treatment, 
the best, um, they have the most likely chances of staying uh, sober. And then lastly, again, the statistic that uh, just broke my heart was that 60% of people in recovery will die of a tobacco-related illness. And so for me, as someone who worked in the system, um, my husband runs a treatment center. This is, if you do this work, it's out of peg. It's out of investment in, in helping to save people's lives, right? Treatment and recovery is really about giving somebody their life back. And we weren't talking about the one thing that was most likely to take their life. And uh, it just, it riled up something in me a little bit of activism in me that, oh my goodness, we have to start doing something. We are not addressing the one thing that's most likely to end their life prematurely. We need to change that. I'm going to give you, so that's on, that's the data around the people with addictions. I want to also share some about folks that have mental health concerns. So there's some serious data around that population. So, um, recent statistic from CDC is that individuals that have a serious mental illness have a 25-year shorter lifespan than general population. We see some of the similar high tobacco use rates in this population as we do with those individuals dealing with addictions. Anywhere from 40 to 70 percent, depending on the diagnosis are tobacco users compared to the 17% of the general population that smokes in the United States. This population does not only um, smokes at a higher rate, they also tend to smoke uh, heavier. They also tend to be some of those who are maybe a two pack a day smoker. So they're heavy smokers on top of that. And as a result, we are seeing devastating consequences of twice the rate cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes in the general population, three times the rate of emphysema and COPD as the general population, and three times the rate of cancer. So, you know, begs that question, how does it, someone with mental illness end up with such risk factors from their uh, tobacco use is, is very concerning. And I think that's, again, part of what got me passionate about this work is, is it becomes, once you start seeing this data, it's easy to see tobacco use and, and addiction as really a social justice issue, that more and more are individuals that are really burdened with addiction and mental health issues and also poverty, when we look at that data, are continue to struggle with with tobacco use and and we really need to advocate and help and support them getting education and, and treatment. So one of the other uh, pieces of data that I share with um, uh, staff that are doing this work to again help to try to prioritize the work we are doing on addressing tobacco is an, an overview of the leading causes of preventable death in the United States. So I'm going to share some data. What this is, is annual um, deaths that are preventable by and are caused by different things. So this is Mandy, and I'm interjecting because I want everybody to like cue in. <laughs> this blew my mind. Thanks, Deb. <laughs> Thanks, Mandy. So um, illegal drugs. We see uh, an amazing number, as you all know, of deaths that we're seeing due to heroin. It's been in the news. We have, we know we have an opioid crisis and are focusing on it. So we are seeing about 20,000 on average over the last five years, about 20,000 deaths per year in the United States, mainly due to heroin. This also could be attributable to, to meth or cocaine, but all illegal drugs. We're seeing about $20,000, 20,000 murders every year in our country. Uh, very concerning the levels of suicide, which we all are focusing on and, and working on, especially with our youth. 45,000 suicides in our country on average every year. Alcohol, deaths related to alcohol, this is due to um, long term disease like sclerosis of the liver or alcohol poisoning, alcohol overdose. Um, I think that alcohol overdose is still the leading cause of death of teenagers. So we, we really still see alcohol as a real deadly and concerning uh, substance. 
And then prescription drugs, again, we're all aware of the toll and the death rate that we're seeing now with prescription drug overdoses and deaths at about 49,000 a year across this country. Um, but it doesn't compare with what we're seeing with tobacco. We also know that just being exposed to secondhand smoke, it, we're, we're seeing uh, 41,000 deaths per year due to being in a household with secondhand smoke or a workplace where secondhand smoke is almost as many deaths as, as some of the other higher uses. But 40, 480,000 people die every year in the United States due to tobacco-related illness. And, you know, I'm struck now, I, I don't want to minimize, I don't want to dismiss the impact of all of these other issues. I personally have had lost family members to every single one of the other issues that are listed. I don't want to minimize the impact. However, um, I, 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 here's the sarcastic in me. Where's, when are we going to have the tobacco epidemic funding coming? When are we going to start focusing on, on tobacco? And why are we not um, talking about the fact that we see this many deaths every year due to this product? And this, this is Mandy again. I just want to interject that when we were planning up for this webinar, you know, we were kind of struggling with the title for a little while. And then finally the words, a red flag for supports came in. And the red flag is really, I think, illustrated here and, and how easy it is to not be aware of the nicotine and tobacco related deaths. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think it's too, you know, they're, they, they're different. I mean, when we see the other deaths, they're immediate. Uh, you're seeing that immediate consequence of, of use of those products. And often with tobacco, that it, that's a 20, 30 year down the road. You know, we have youth, you know, young people that are dying from these other issues that we see. And the, the consequences for their tobacco use is, are, is not going to come to way down the road. But we do know that for adults, half of the adults who use tobacco products will die prematurely of a tobacco-related illness. So I just, the point is we just, you know, I'm, uh, when people say, well, that's the least of our worries, I guess it's really how you look at it. It's, it's, it is the product. It is the drug that ultimately is the most deadly of all the things that, that we are, are, are treating. And then the, the last slide before I start talking into what, what does this mean for our youth? Um, this is, is data. This is 10 years old, but I, uh, I think that, um, this, is, this was a, a simple pie chart that, once again, really caused me to reframe how I look at tobacco use. So let me explain. Um, what this shows is current tobacco users, when they did this survey in 2008, 41% of the adult smokers were currently, by defined by the past month, currently dealing with either a mental illness or a substance use disorder. So 41% of smokers fell into that category. Another 35% were in recovery that, that had lifetime, somewhere in their life had had mental health issues or an addiction and were currently in recovery. So, and then 23% of the current smokers did not have either of those issues. So what this tells you is that 77% of current smokers have, are either currently or in their past have dealt with mental health or addictions issues. And what, where this has happened is as we brought down our tobacco use rates, and if you think about it back in the 60s, you know, about 60% of adults smoke and it's gone back down about 10% every day. And so in the 90s, we had about 30% of, of adult smoking. And as we've helped people quit, as a lot of the general population has quit and how the norms have changed, and we really reduced those rates of smoking, who's left? Who's left are really those individuals who have complex co-occurring issues of addiction and mental health that are complicating their ability and getting in the way of that ability for them to be able to to quit and and what I see and what what experts in this field are seeing is really that shape of a really rethink about the adult tobacco user and that what we know is who's left 
at least 77% of adult smokers have other co-occurring issues or have had those issues in their past. And so it's, again, that reframing has happened in, in that we're seeing tobacco maybe as an indicator of something else that might be going on. And a couple years ago, I learned about a, a protocol that the Kaiser Permanente Health System in Southern California, based on this information, is trying a pilot project. And so when their uh, participants come in, their um, members come in for a doctor's appointment, and that standard screening happens, and the doctor says, do you use tobacco products, and yes or no, if they say yes, then that is going to trigger uh, additional screening. And so their physicians, if someone says that they are a tobacco user, are now doing screenings for mental health or addiction substance use issues. Because what this data shows us is odds are that that person has underlying mental health or addictions issues underneath, that, underneath tobacco. And the statistics show us that that's true. And again, another in my journey, that was this profound aha to me that we're really looking at tobacco in a different way as a potential symptom of other things that might be going on. So I sat with that. I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. And I thought to myself, well, is that the same with our kids? Do we have the same thing happening with our youth who use tobacco products? And that got me digging into our data with the Healthy Youth Survey. So again, going back a little bit on our journey, that, that what I described with the adults, that we had a high percentage and that we've driven those rates down and down and down and now we have a, a different profile, we, we have that same thing that's happening with the youth. So back in 2001 in Washington State, we got the master settlement agreement monies where the attorney general sued the tobacco companies. And there was a tobacco program started in the state of Washington. And all of us ESDs were funded to do youth tobacco intervention. And we started bringing in all kinds of programs with all these initials, not tap tag. And we brought in all these curriculums. And the model that we created was in the schools that we separated out youth who had drug and alcohol issues from the youth who were referred to us for smoking. And we did specific interventions. We did classes, not is not on tobacco, we had the, the tobacco awareness program, tobacco education group, and ending nicotine dependence are those curriculums. And we had a different policy with a lower discipline rate, and we, we had a different pathway for our youth smokers. And when I look back on it, I do think it made sense. We had uh, a high, we had 25, we had over 25% of our seniors who were tobacco users, and we had high numbers. And I think that many of the tobacco users we provide services to, that, that was all that they were doing. There was that old smokers group at the corner, and there were a, a, just a group of youth that just smoked, and having a tobacco-specific curriculum really made sense. However, we have seen the same rates of reduction around tobacco use with our students that we, have, um, that we had with the adults. And so I wondered, again, is that same phenomenon. Back in 2001, we had a different profile of tobacco users and maybe it made sense to treat them only with their tobacco use. But as we've driven down those use rates, I wondered whether or not our youth had the same kind of co-occurring issues that our adults did. So I took a look at some of that data with the amazing Healthy Youth Survey database that we all have access to. And Surprising or not surprising, uh, this is what I found. Oh, and this is, oh, sorry, this is a data that shows right now in 20, well, actually, this is from 2016. As all of you are preparing, we're going to be getting our 28 survey data. Surveys are being done weeks, and we'll be updating that data. But so right now, with 10th graders in the state of Washington, 6% use cigarettes, 13% are reported to be using cigarettes or e-cigarettes or vaping products. And we have 3% that are using smokeless tobacco. And this was as of 2016. 
Deb, just out of curiosity for folks who may not be familiar with the term smokeless tobacco, what, what does that include? So that would be um, uh, chew like Copenhagen. And also there's some um, these things that are little pouches called, like bandits. So there's, there's, you know, chew tobacco or the, the pouches of tobacco that you also place in your mouth. So here's what our data found when I started to do those correlations. First, I looked at um, depression. And so the first column, this is what, I was, what I'm calling non-users. So all of the students who said they do not use cigarettes or e-cigarettes or smokeless tobacco, so they don't use any nicotine product at all, 30% of those 10th graders reported having depression. But you can see that rate rise then when we look at chew tobacco users up to 48%, e-cigarette users at 50%, and then our, our cigarette users, our, our smokers, up way up at almost twice that rate, 59% reported depression compared to those youth who did not use any of those products. And then as you can see, we see a similar pattern um, when we ask the question about have you contemplated committing suicide in the last year? So for those youth who are not nicotine users, that's down at 18%. And then again, you see that rise up almost three times the rate of, of contemplating suicide with our smokers. Um, but again, really elevated, double the rate for smokeless tobacco users and e-cigarette users. So, you know, when you shared some of this early data with me, it, it really put things in perspective. Um, I've had a series of years where I've served in primarily a mental health advocacy role, and now I've, I've shifted to more behavioral health role. And I just couldn't wait for this to be um, amplified, this message, because so often we focus on separate issues of substance use or mental health. And with mental health being in the forefront the way it is, I just really appreciate your messages around the co-occurring and being able to find and, and help youth earlier and sooner. And this is potentially one of the ways to do that. Thank you, Mandy. So that's some of the data I found around mental health issues, and then now be prepared to be stunned when I share the other substance use correlations. I, I even was, was shocked when, I, when this data came up. So when we look at alcohol use, so for those youth, again, who, who say they're not using any nicotine products, smoking, e-cigarettes, or smokeless tobacco, only 16% of 10th graders report using alcohol. But look at the change. Um, our e-cigarette users, smokeless tobacco, and tobacco use, the, this is the percentage of youth who, who say they're all smoking and drinking. Very high percentage. And then, again, similar amazing, <laughs> shocking results around marijuana use. When you see only 13% of those youth that are using any nicotine products and the high rates of, of marijuana use for those who use both products. Um, I also want to point out that there's a lot of talk about vaping and e-cigarette. And, and a lot of us are being kind of pitched the fact, oh, well, that's different. It's a fad. It's, um, there, you know, it's a whole different group of youth that are vaping and they're experimenting and it's just a hip thing to do. But if you, but they're the same kids. I mean, the profile is there. And again, look back at the um, data. The e-cigarette users are right there. They're, they have the same risk factor, the same profiles of use. So I would argue that they still have the same issues. They're just using a different product. And, and again, to not think of that as something different, but the risk factors are there. And, um, and the, the, that was another profound thing for me to see that the youth that report e-cigarette use have that same risk profile as a tobacco user. Uh, the other thing I, I want to, uh, again, point out is that you know, none of these things are caused. Depression, increased risk for suicide, and substance use, they're not caused by tobacco use. And what, um, what this is, it shows that, and, and um, that they're all, all of these issues have the same root causes of trauma, 
uh, mental health issues that I would find we did these same correlations say with alcohol you're going to see the same high rates of depression anxiety suicidality with youth who use alcohol who use who report marijuana use who the youth who report opioid use that there's underlying mental health issues behind substance use with the youth that that we serve so again that conclusion that um that we made with with the adults that when we see somebody who's using tobacco that maybe we ought to screen for mental health and addictions issues is the same I'm going to make that same recommendation now with tobacco users that when when you as a school staff uh, encounter a youth who's vaping or smoking to remember this data that odds are very strongly the odds and when, look, when we look at this data the odds are that they're depressed potentially suicidal they're using alcohol and they're using marijuana. That to see those youth as a, as probably having multiple things going on. So um, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time as to why that is and what nicotine, it, why why we see youth that have mental health and trauma issues drawn towards using nicotine. Nicotine is a very powerful drug. It's a psychoactive drug that impacts the brain and um, has a lot of positive effects. And, and uh, as a presenter reminded me the other day, and there's reasons people use drugs is because they work. They do something. They do something for you. It draws people. And nicotine has a lot of initial effects, especially for kids, for teenagers. It actually um, makes you feel better. It decreases anxiety. It wakes you up. It helps you think. It helps you focus. There's a lot of positive things that nicotine does for you. And nicotine is a psychoactive drug. Nicotine goes into the brain and it really releases all of these different brain chemicals. So as you, it's, um, it's an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety agent all at the same time. It, it helps to wake you up. It helps to release the arousing neurotransmitters that help you focus and help you think. It also releases the calming neurotransmitters that help you calm down. It impacts the dopamine pathway, which we know is part of addiction. It even actually increase, it actually releases endorphins that can actually pay, kill pain and help calm you down. So it's a very powerful drug that does amazing things. The problem is it's very addictive. And the reason is very good is it wears off very quickly. So you can have a cigarette, you can have, you know, use your jewel, and within an hour, that drug starts wearing off. And while the nicotine does this, it wears off, and then it happens. And this is nicotine withdrawal. It's basically the opposite of what nicotine does for you. When it wears off, this is what happens. And as you become a regular nicotine user, you stop getting some of those benefits and really you're just needing to use to not feel the pain and not to have the withdrawal symptoms. So again, it, nicotine is a very attractive drug to someone who's dealing with trauma, pain, mental health issues. It helps them feel better. And then as they start using it, they become quickly um, addicted. So that's a little bit about Nicotine Neurochemistry 101. So uh, uh, my final recommendation, so based on all of this, here's my recommendations and here's my thoughts and, and, and here's what I tell the schools that I work with and, and what I encourage. First off is let's reframe. Let's reframe thinking about youth who are use, who were catching using tobacco or vape in school. Shift it from just a, somebody breaking the rules to maybe someone we should be concerned about. And again, the data shows odds are that students also drinking using is dealing with depression or anxiety and may even be suicidal. So think about that, reframe that. Um, the second recommendation I'm gonna make is that we look at combining our policies into one policy. Uh, many schools have a separate tobacco smoking policy that's different um, pathway of consequences than alcohol and drugs. And I would say, let's keep it simple and put them all on an even playing field because odds are they're they're probably doing all of those things I get a lot of questions what do I do about vaping and we don't know what's in it do I do a marijuana is it marijuana is it? and so 
What we suggest is that the policy just includes the device, that if you're using that de drug delivery device, it doesn't matter what's in it, the device itself is a policy violation. So we're gonna recommend that we combine that policy all in one and that we treat it all the same way. I also, again, will say, can we minimize that time or eliminate time out of school for substance use violations? My biggest fear when I have do a webinar like this or share this data is that we're gonna see increased discipline violations on tobacco and vaping and that the result of that is going to be more kids that are expelled or suspended from school. And that, that would break my heart if that happened because we don't want to see those unintended consequences for this information. That we want to see this the substance use discipline as an underlying issue that students need help with. It doesn't mean that we don't want to, that there shouldn't be a consequence, but that there's a second chance, that there's concern, that we're looking at what's going on and doing our best to not uh, have kids spend time out of school for a substance use violation. The other data I didn't show you was that you, the kids that use, they're the ones that are getting D's and F's. So this is, uh, these are often youth that are not doing well academically to begin with and I would hate to see them miss school. Lastly, we, again, we would like to see anybody who's getting discipline because they're caught with tobacco or vape devices, that we have some sort of a screening happen. Uh, because odds are they've got other issues going on. And that we build into that uh, discipline policy opportunity and a process for them to be talked to and screened and referred to whatever services you might have to for further assessment on mental health and substance use issues. There's some additional resources uh, on the slides that you can, can go to to get additional information. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Deb. What fascinating information for us all. We do have a poll for us. Um, so we're gonna get that loaded up. Maybe. <laughs> and we're gonna look at that. So. Do you know the place all your students go to smoke or vape? Yes or no? Does your school have a screening process for drug and alcohol? So um, we're gonna launch that poll for you. And we're, we're gonna take a couple of questions from the audience um, for Deb. So um, one of them was, does the alcohol death number include drunk car accidents? No, you know? right. it does not. Mm -hmm. And did those tobacco use percentages include e-cigarettes, e or were the two separate, like the 10th grade use slide? Or, or um, for tobacco use? Go back. Yeah, so that's just cigarettes. Just cigarettes there? Okay. And Jen asked us, is correlations between tobacco use and adverse childhood experiences have you looked at that that's a, yes so we are seeing absolutely about twice for all substances about twice the use rates for youth that have a high level of adverse childhood experiences for all substances it's absolutely one of the highest risk factors we have that we know of for uh, substance use is childhood experience childhood adverse childhood experiences and trauma absolutely it's a harder one to measure because we don't ask those in health use survey, mm -hmm. but there's been some definite, there's been some great research to show that we're seeing very high rates of substance use among those kids with ACEs. And I'll throw into that, um, I think it was on the CDC um, tobacco website, and maybe we can link to that, that I think they also referenced ACEs as um, a risk factor for use. And we had a couple more questions. Um, in those statistics, are the students' kids um, asked their reasons for using the products? And in Healthy Youth Survey, I don't think they are. There is not. There mm -hmm. is not. And also, did you look at energy drinks? Do they precede nicotine usage? That's an interesting question. Is that asked in the Healthy Youth Survey? I think it might still be a question. So in that's something out that we could take a look at um, and try that correlation with uh, the Healthy Youth Survey. Yeah. data. Good question. Yeah, nice engagement from everybody. Um, and we do have some results. So 
uh, for our polling question. Uh, we asked, do you know the place? Most people, half of them said yes, and about half said no. Okay. And does your school have a screening process for drug and alcohol? 63% uh, said yes, and um, oh, we have some great. don't know, and we have some no, so there you go. Okay, good. Um, next up, we do have Tina Johnson. She's a student assistance professional, and she's at Hudson's Bay High School in Vancouver uh, School District. And Tina's going to tell us a little bit more about her past experience, and she's going to share her screen with us here for a second. Um, and how do you know Tina, Deb? Yeah, so Tina is a staff member uh, that works at ESD 112, and we have her place at Hudson's Bay High School in uh, Vancouver as a student assistance professional. So she works with all the youth who, who need support on substance use issues. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Tina, you ready? You might be muted, Tina. <laughs> oh, there. Can you hear me now? Oh, we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> victory. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I'm Tina Johnson. Um, I'm from Bay High School in Vancouver. Um, I've been here since last year. Um, and for that, I worked at SD 113 in. Um, in Person County and was the prevention there as well as doing uh, in high schools and before that was um, with Together, a nonprofit doing substance use prevention in Thurston County and um, surrounding counties and then um, before that was uh, serving in uh, different nonprofit youth serving organizations. So I've been working with teenagers for about 20 years. Um, I really like working with teenagers. And um, last year I went to, maybe I just should move to the next thing. Um, there, I'm so sorry, please be patient. Yeah, okay. Um, so last year I was working with students who had been um, referred to me for smoking or vaping, getting caught on campus. And, um, uh, and so they, the um, the norm on, in our campus was to put them in a smoking class that was uh, three sessions long, and then um, and then that would be would be it for them. And for me, really, really um, frustrated because as I was sitting there with students, they were um, I could see that they had a lot of other issues going on. They were um, using multiple substances. They were um, experiencing mental health symptoms, and um, and so I was really grateful when Deb offered this kind of really confirmed the experience that I was having in my group, and um, and so after that training, it I went back to my building and basically just said I was only taking as I brought, as students got in trouble for tobacco or other substances, that they would just come in, do a full screening, and they would, um, I would put them in, in the place that was uh, most representative of what their needs were. So whether that was mental health or that was um, a substance use treatment. So, um, yeah, so that basically is what I did. And, um, and so then I had I mean, these students were getting served for what their, their true needs were because it was um, just changing the conversation around, around sub, like the siloedness of the substances. Um, that really, this is just looking at a big issue. It's pretty complex for um, what students are facing. Um, I'm really fortunate to be in a building that is... Um, where we have administration and staff that are really committed to a restorative and trauma-informed practice. Um, they working with the culture. Um, I think I'm supposed to be on this slide. I'm sorry, getting lost. But um, so they've been through a multi-year grant. Um, so they're like on year five of five, and. It's through that, they have changed their discipline policies a lot around substance 
use. And um, so now what we see is when a student gets in trouble for a substance, some a day or a day and a half, um, depending on what the situation is. Um, but then they're they're coming back, they're getting screened. Um, I mean, they're having like a meeting. We have a full on meeting with administration and parents and students and um, me and any other supports that would be relevant in that room that we think would be relevant and coming up with a plan to serve that student well um, to really provide supports that they're using substances to probably manage some of the, the stuff that's going on for them, whether that's um, academic struggles or mental health struggles, um, whatever's going on. And so um, just wrapping some support around them and, and hoping um, that we move forward with that plan. Uh, there's a lot of other high schools in our district that are following this suit. Um, I know that we are pretty committed to moving forward um, the way that we've been doing it um, with the reduction in suspension. I know that a lot of people have seemed to have some pushback, like I heard pushback last year from some parents that would have some issues or feeling like, oh, they're not getting in trouble, they're not getting in trouble, but um, it's, uh, it's just really, it's just reframing the conversation with them of the, what substance use is and that it um, is really like an indicator of something else going on for them. And um, so this will likely continue. There is other, um, there's been written policy changes. So that is what will sustain our work as we move forward um, here on our campus. So what advice would I give to people this work, it would be to um, just kind of assess where your team is at, um, whether, like, where are they in their level of understanding of this issue, um, if they already are on board with, um, with looking at this issue through a lens of, um, like, trauma-informed practice, um, or restorative practice, understanding that students um, get placed in these spaces um, or get kicked out and it really just makes the problem worse in the long term. Um, so just really giving some education to administrators and I know that Deb can really speak to this uh, probably a lot more um, eloquently. Um, for me on my campus, I'm really, um, I guess I'm at a, at a lower level because I'm here in educating staff or supporting staff in making these policies happen just updating policies and procedures, um, marrying those uh, tobacco policies with the rest of the substance use ones and, um, and really reframing the conversation around how, we, how do we support the student because they clearly are in a space where they need support. Um, and whether that's mental health support or substance use support um, or intervention support, maybe it's academic intervention support, um, it might look different, it might look really complex. Um, and definitely implementing the screening process by looking at having a good screening, sitting down with each student, and it takes time, but they are definitely worth the time. And um, yeah, that's really all it, that I have on um, on my. I think. Yeah. I just want to thank you guys and know that this work is important. Thank you so much, Tina. That's really interesting information. Um, this is Mandy Paradise again, and I just wanted to highlight that Tina's role in her school district and with the ESD 112 is as a student assistance professional and as part of the student assistance program. So fortunate to have schools across Washington State have staff like Tina um, work with them. And um, you know, if you're interested in more of the kind of services that we offer, you can visit the OSPI Prevention Intervention website and we'll make sure you get that link live. Uh, we'll also turn some of Deb's slides into one-pagers for folks who are interested in having them, especially the big ideas 
uh, I think that that can be really helpful when you work with your coalitions or you work with your district or you work with parents and students or youth coalitions. So um, we'll keep you all posted. And if you are interested in hearing more about that type of work, feel free to reach out to me directly. So we're going to take just one moment to capture some of your major takeaways from the webinar today. And if you want to share those in the chat, we always like to read those and learn from your experience and to see what you're getting out of uh, what we're offering. Um, we did have one last question from Brittany. Um, I'm looking to create a newsletter article that engages and informs families and community about this health issue for our students. What would you recommend focusing on as main bulletin points? Do you have any additional resources or links we could direct people to? Sure, and um, the great resources and links are already on the PowerPoint and on the Mandy. Yeah, the, our website. Your website, yes. You've, you've posted the, these links and resources. We have prevention intervention website where we do have specifically some pre-drafted materials related to vaping and nicotine. But um, the ones that Deb provided, that you provided in your slide deck, uh, we can make those links available yeah. to you for further information. And maybe HYS data. Right. So I think two key points that I would want to get across in a newsletter article is, one, um, there's a lot of perception that, you know, tobacco is just not, is the least of our worries and vaping is just not that big of a deal. And so to reframe that and, again, to remind people tobacco is really by far the leading cause of preventable death. It's, it's, it's the most dangerous drug there is. And, um, and, that, and it, that, that vaping is uh, a pro, it, you know, it has nicotine in it, which is a very powerful drug. And then also to share that odds are that what we're seeing is tobacco use is often a symptom of deeper issues that are happening with that young person. And to, to look past, one, to address tobacco use because it is a serious thing, but to also see it as an indicator of maybe other underlying issues that are going on with that young person, uh, emerging mental health issues or trauma. or um, and, and so to see past that and see it maybe as a symptom of other things that might be going on. So truly a red flag for caring supports that wrap around um, that, I think that that's one of our big summaries here today and why we asked Deb and Tina to present was because we started this by saying it's because we care about youth and this is something that affects life course so if we can intervene effectively and early and not just as a discipline response but as a health response by having treatment options early and, and multiple opportunities for recovery that can really make a big difference. Thank you everybody. Um, we do have an evaluation. We're interested in continuous improvement. So that evaluation, um, we have the link posted into the chat. If you want to click on that and let us know how you think we've done today and what we can do to improve. Um, this link is also available in our reminders. So if you'd like to tell us later, you can also do that. Next month, we're going to be looking at community partnerships, and we do have two webinars. So we'll have one on early warning systems and one that goes deeper into a student group. And all of our images come from the Creative Commons, and we like to give credit where it's due. A lot of them come from Canva.com and the Noun Project. Um, thank you, presenters, and for our audience. Um, we really appreciate everybody's ability to participate and um, offer such great information. Thanks. Thank you. See you next month.